Um, we're here to talk about uh, the newer frameworks that are out there and some problems we've seen with them. Go into a little bit more detail. Actually, before we kick off anything, does anybody have like who works day to day with Node? Okay. Who works day to day with Play, Scala? Okay. A couple people. Awesome. So yeah, I'm Mike. Uh, working at Invisium with Ken, director of professional services, motocross junkie. Did some work in uh, film. Was the body double for Powder. Great, great film. Yeah. All my references are very out of date. Don't fact check any of that. I'm uh, Ken or Jim or Kevin. Everybody screws up my name. It's three letters. I really am Ken Johnson. Um, so if you're expecting Kevin Johnson, that's a different room. Yeah, more exciting talk. Uh, so I'm the CTO of Invisium. Um, my duties include uh, taking out the trash, sweeping, <laughs> Things like that. Uh, recovering Red Bull Addict without the uh, recovery, and I am a Husky Ginger. I own it. I'm proud of it. So essentially, we have uh, uh, some established uh, frameworks we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to compare those somewhat with, as we go through each control that's uh, broken or insecure with the newer frameworks, we're going to compare that to the older frameworks. Um, and we will give you a synopsis, uh, which is essentially our solution statement or proposed solution. <clears throat> this talk is not a criticism of other people's hard work. Uh, I really don't like it when I see talks and it's kind of like fail, pwn, all that. I mean, I'm sure, you know, security conference, some people like that. I don't. So I think if people put a lot of work into these frameworks and put a lot of uh, their personal time into it, most of it's open source. So I think we respect that. Um, but we, you know, doesn't mean we can't point out some of the flaws with it. So the frameworks we're kind of comparing Node and Scala to are uh, Django and Rails. So you guys are probably familiar with those two. They've been around, been around for a while. Um, I've worked a bunch with Rails at Living Social, so more familiar with kind of how Rails works. But it has a lot of security built into it. Uh, kind of has, gets out of the way in terms of the security controls, does a lot out of the box. Um, Django, same way, it's probably actually a little better than Rails in some ways. Uh, the developers seem to be a little more paranoid about security, which is actually a good thing. Um, so we're going to compare those frameworks to some of the newer frameworks that we've seen out there. It probably seems weird that we're calling these established frameworks, but um, they are. I mean, they have, uh, they've gone through some turmoil. Uh, they've cleaned cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, still improving. It's an iter iterative process. I can't talk. Iterative process. <laughs> Words are hard. Um, Close enough. Yeah. So, uh, and you have folks like Justin in the back, the creator of Breakman, like which I personally use. You know, hero. So uh, he helps. You know, he built the uh, static analysis tool for Rails. So there's a lot of people contributing security-wise. I really hope some of you Arrested Development fans or have at least seen like one episode or none of these pictures are going to make any sense. So the newer frameworks we're talking about, uh, Play um, and Getty. Play is a Scala-based framework, or actually Scala or Java. Um, you can use either one with it. I'll talk a few, about a few more details um, with that. Getty is a Node.js-based framework, also an MVC like Play and Rails. Um, they haven't been, neither one's been around as long as Django or Rails or Spring or, you know, the other older frameworks. Um, so here's some of the details about the older frameworks. So we'll start with Rails. So it's an MVC framework, model view controller. hope some of you might be familiar with what that means, but models are your, your kind of your data layer, how it interacts with the database. Um, views are where HTML happen or your JavaScript, um, and the controller is kind of where the business logic is, and that's kind of, the controller um, matches up the view to the database, so you have your form that goes to columns in a database. Um, Rails has been around since around 2004, so almost 10 years old in the middle of this year, so it's been around for a while in terms of, you know, the web. So, and 2013 was a pretty interesting year for Rails. If anyone here uses it, they know that January and February. Um, 
of last year were not super fun. If you read the second paragraph of this email, you can see that um, you have a vulnerability in Rails that had uh, SQL injection, remote code execution, denial of service, and bypassing authentication systems. This is a really fun email to get when you're working in a Rails shop. So 2013 was a pretty bad year for Rails and security. There was this. Uh, Ruby Gems was hacked. They host um, the open source libraries for Rails. They were hacked. Someone was able to uh, perform remote code execution on their system. They had to basically tear everything down, check, make sure no malicious code is um, uploaded. It took a lot of time. And uh, it was kind of a wake up call for the Ruby Gems folks and kind of the Rails community overall. Um, and also, there was three or four more other big security releases for Rails at the beginning of last year. So it was kind of a, it was a really rough start for the Rails community last year. Um, so the good thing is that there's been some maturity in that space and kind of Rails developers have gotten a little more aware of the fact that they need to think about security more often. Uh, there's been a couple of projects that have been born out of what happened last year. Um, so it was a good and a bad thing. So out of the box, Rails gives you CSERF protection, um, cross-site scripting protection. It output encodes all your parameters in, uh, in your views. It gives you pretty good mass assignment protection. Um, clickjacking, you can get integrated pretty easily with some Ruby gems. Um, Neil, the guy who is putting on this, um, this conference, he actually wrote a gem called Secure Headers, which gives you clickjacking protection. You can get CSP very easy to integrate with any Rails app. Um, and in Rails 4, they've done a better job of session handling. They moved to an encrypted session instead of a, just a signed session, which is true in Rails 2 and 3. So this now you can't actually see the data that's in your session. Uh, I'll touch on that a little more later. But they're making improvements kind of slow and steady um, in Rails. Django. Django is also an MVC framework. Uh, it was released in 2003, so it's almost 11 years old now. Uh, I like to think of it as a little bit more security focused. If you read the documentation for most things that you do within, uh, within Django, um, you get a lot of uh, warnings. Uh, you know, hey, this is insecure. Uh, this is probably the best way to do it. Um, here's how we've default configured it. Uh, if you change it, here's the consequence. So they do a pretty good job. Uh, like I said, it's very well documented. Um, so essentially, mass assignment is, unless you change things around like, you know, I, I really don't know the, uh, the level of familiarity in the room with, uh, who's worked with Django? Okay. So technically unless you remove the fields, um, you should be restricted in terms of mass assignment. Uh, CSER protection, a um, little weird. Uh, this is where there are some things that the newer frameworks and older frameworks both kind of, in my opinion, um, don't do super well. Rails, uh, by default, has CSERF on. Um, and any form generated by the framework immediately puts the CSERF token into the form. So it's just included in the request. You don't have to think about it. And Jenga is a little bit different where you have to manually, you know, put in the, either use the, you can put in the CSERF token manually within the form or you can use the, uh, uh, there's there's another way to do it, and I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, XSS protection is by default uh, on, um, and you have to bypass it by calling a method to uh, to actually break outside of that. So by def there's some things that by default are kind of there and done for you, uh, and well documented. Most importantly, and then in the session handling um, is this is probably important to note. How many of you have heard of the issue with client-side cookies and them just never expiring? Some familiarity with it? Okay, so um, when you abstract the sessions out into the database or, you know, Redis, whatever the case is, um, you limit this issue, right? Because even if I stole the session secret, signing it um, and forging the data is going to be problematic because that's just not the way it's, it's default to, or that's not how it's working. So with Django, um, back to the documentation, if you were to change this, it says if you want to make this a client-side cookie and you're using Pickle's uh, serialization, 
uh, understand that you know, if that session token is stolen and a cookie is forged, you're now vulnerable to remote code execution. So, pretty good job on Django's part of documenting this stuff. So, what I'm going to talk about uh, again is Node Getty. Interesting fun fact Getty is actually named after Getty Lee uh, from Rush. Um, so, actually, his real name was Gary, but his mother had a thick accent, so they, so they say that uh, it was pronounced like Getty. Getty. So, uh, fun fact. Uh, Node is non blocking IO, it's server side JS. What does that really boil down to? It's incredibly fast. Um, for sites that are running Node, like before I can even view the response headers and see if, you know, it says server express or whatever the case may be, um, you pr I pretty much can tell this is a node site just because of the, the quick response times. Um, the, but the code uh, is very heavy on the asynchronous side, so very quick. Um, Getty is an MVC, it's very Rails esque. I'll show you some, uh, some code, and for those of you familiar with Rails, you'll, it's like a copycat, it's just the JS version of Rails. Uh, but more vulnerable. Um, but it is very useful. And I actually really like it. So, uh, you know, when we talk about solutions, you know, once, once this thing's hardened, I, I would love to use it. Um, I think it's pretty cool. So I'll be talking about uh, Play. Um, Play is a Scala and Java based framework. So you can, it's built in Java and Scala, and you can either use Java or Scala um, to write apps in it. Uh, Scala is an object functional language, tries to take kind of the best of both worlds of object oriented and functional languages. Uh, it compiles the Java bytecode, so it runs on the JVM. Uh, it's, people say it's like good Java. When you come from a Java background, Scala is supposed to be like, you know, so much easier to write code, so much less boiler, boiler, boilerplate. Um, and Play, yeah, it's an MVC, it's easy to build scalable web apps. There's a uh, asynchronous layer called ACA, I think that's how you say it, uh, built in. So you can do a lot of processing asynchronously, uh, very easily, very fast. Um, it's been around since around 2007. That's when the first kind of inklings of the, the framework came about, but it's really uh, gotten a lot more popular in the past couple years. Um, some companies uh, that are using it are like Coursera for their, um, their education system. Clout, LinkedIn's using it for some of their systems. Not their main site yet, as far as I know. Uh, Guilt is using it for pretty much all of their apps. Um, I know Twitter was using it at some point. I'm not sure if they're still using it. And Living Social, I know, used it for some service, some APIs, basically. Um, so it's getting some use. It's getting more popular because you know people always complain about Rails being slow. So people are moving to these Java-based language or Java-based frameworks because they get the speed kind of the ease of use of Rails. So here's just a little Shodan search for play session. Um, so that's just the default cookie value and there's about 4,600 apps out there that Shodan found. So there's a, you know, a good amount of apps out there using play at least somewhat. So to get into the vulnerability side, so uh, I really enjoyed Brian Helmkamp's talk about Rails. It's called uh, Rails Insecure Defaults. It basically talked about what you get when you create a new Rails app, all kind of the insecure defaults that might bite you. Um, he went through about 13 things that when you run Rails new app name and you create a new app, what you get um, and what you don't get and kind of the gotchas of the Rails security world. Uh, so I'm going to I kind of took that inspiration and kind of thought about like and looked at play and looked at what you got and what you didn't get out of the box with the new play app. So those are a couple, of, those are the topics I'll be covering. Um, so to start off, like Ken was talking about, by default it uses client side sessions. So these kind of like Rails 3 are clear text, they're signed, not encrypted. So if you put something sensitive in there, it's going to be in a cookie and the user can look at it or an attacker who gets that cookie could, could look at it. Um, and just like Rails, there's no server-side expiration by default. So those cookies never really expire. I mean, your browser will expire them if you set an expiration date. But they, you know, they don't truly expire. And I did a little bit of Dave Kennedy-esque passive reconnaissance on a couple um, play apps out there. 
And a lot of them use the same session value over and over again. You log out, you log in, same session value every single time. So they don't really expire. And um, the image in the middle is from the press uh, about the Rails issue that popped up a couple months ago. Uh, it's pretty well known, like most, I think a lot of Ruby or Rails developers know about the issue with Rails cookies, the fact that they never expire. Um, but there is a little bit of FUD out there about Rails and how big of an issue this is. Um, but it's kind of, an, it's kind of expected with client-side sessions. Um, so I it just, it's the bad thing about client-side sessions is there's no true expiration server-side. And you can see how easy it is to put something into the session. It's just session.put and then the value. And then you can have, you know, you can use the session as a store, which is not a good idea because it's clear text. So an attacker can't modify it but because it's signed, but they can view it. Um, and on the bottom, you can see this is one of the apps I took a look at. And this is on an uh, invalid login, but it gives me back my email address and my password in clear text in a cookie. So. <laughs> not the uh, not the best. So here's another area that's pretty similar to Rails. Um, when GitHub's advanced search came out, everyone started digging through GitHub for you know like SSH key is another kind of sensitive files. Um, so if you search for secret token .rb, that's the file that holds the Rails uh, session signing token. And you can see there were a lot of results. Thankfully now, since people are a little more aware, they started taking those out and making those environmental variables. But Play has the same issue. Basically, at the bottom you can see the application secret just sits in a file called application.conf and that's going to be in source code from the get-go. So if you check that into source code and then you use that secret in production and you have an open source project, um, yeah, you, people can forge signatures. So. Um, and it's the same in development and production. So, uh, and in terms of a suggestion to get around this, definitely uh, we think frameworks should do two things. Uh, one, make it a separate file that automatically is part of the git ignore so it won't get checked into GitHub. And also make sure that it's an environmental variable on the system so that basically the app won't boot up unless that secret's an environmental variable. That way you won't have it in source code, you won't have it just sitting in a file on every developer's laptop. So XSS, some more similarities to Rails. So Rails and Play, they both output in code by default, which is great. But they do give you some pretty easy ways to uh, introduce cross-site scripting. Um, so Rails had the raw tag and the HTML safe tag. Play in version one had the raw tag, and play in version two, it's the at HTML tag. This basically means turn off HTML encoding for this variable. Um, another great thing is you can basically turn off encoding for everywhere if you just include this in your application.conf. So if you turn off escaping, you have XSS everywhere pretty much. Um, I don't know why they would give you that option, honestly. I don't think there's an easy way to do that in Rails. It seems like a pretty bad thing to be able to do so easily, especially if um, there's, not, there's not a lot of documentation around that and how you can kind of screw yourself over with this. But uh, I'd like to see in, in terms of um, both Rails and Play, making these methods a little scarier. So instead of saying at HTML, it should be like unsafe output encoding or something like that, or not encoding. Um, they use these very benign terms to let you introduce cross-site scripting, so people think at HTML, probably not that big of an issue, I'll just get around this stupid encoding that I keep seeing. Really it should be very clear to you that, uh, you know, this is an unsafe thing to use if you're going to call it on a user parameter. So, uh, Rails actually is kind of worse because it's .html safe, which to me makes it sound like it's safer, not less safe. I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but those are some of the changes I'd like to see in play and in Rails. So mass assignment, um, so Rails has that by default. Play, um, play version one was not by default. By the way, I bring up version one and two because there's actually kind of like a break in the community. Some people really like version one of play and they don't like version two and there's a decent bit of play one apps still out there even though play two is like the evolution of play one. So, um, but in version one you had to explicitly call no binding to not have mass assignment. 
Version 2 and the Scala API, there's no, like, your forms are bound to your data, so there's no way to mass assign in the Scala API. In the Java API, though, you have to bind. So you have to do it explicitly, or you can introduce mass assignment. Um, I think this solution's pretty good, except for I'd say that the documentation for this is not great. Um, I, it was mainly Google Groups that had documentation around this with like the creator of Play talking about it. And he's a little passe, I'd say, about security issues. Um, the Java API, in my opinion, should still be just like the Scala API and uh, you know, should automatically bind for you. So CSERF. Um, Rails has that built in. There's just one method, protect from forgery, in your application controller. Uh, that code is way too small for you to see, but basically it takes one comment to disable it. Um, play, it's a little different. So it's built in in version 102 and up, but to actually enable it takes a decent bit of work. You have to include filters in the application. You have to add it to your global settings. You have to call it on your individual actions, and you have to include it in your forms. So it's a decent bit of work to actually get CSERF working in uh, Play compared to Rails. So I definitely like to see this be way easier in Play. Be like the automatic, you have CSERF built in, it's in all your forms, it's checked everywhere. Um, some more passive reconnaissance showed that there were a lot of apps that were using that had CSERF tokens in their forms, but were not respecting them. So uh, there's clearly some issues around CSERF and Play. So, oh, there you go. I zoomed in for some reason. So yeah, that's how easy it is to turn off CSERF and Rails. And that's how hard it is to get CSERF into play. So there is a module for, um, for play. So Ruby gems for Rails, modules for play. Same kind of basically open source libraries you can add to your application pretty easily. There's one called um, Authenticity Token that makes this a lot easier to add to your play app. but. It takes a decent bit of work, and if you forget to add one of these helpers to your, your actions, you'll, you'll be open to CSERF. So open redirects, I'm kind of a fan of open redirects because they're, like, most people think of them as pretty benign vulnerabilities, but uh, they can end up being JavaScript, so they can be a lot more uh, damaging than just an open redirect, uh, you, just that what you'd think an open redirect would be. So, I mean, every framework pretty much that I've tested has this issue of redirect just redirects you. There's no checking, there's no whitelisting, blacklisting, anything like that. Um, so it's one method in Rails, it's one method in play, just redirect, and you can take a user parameter and redirect to that parameter. Um, I'd really like to see all these frameworks move to kind of an unsafe and a safe redirect. So the default would be um, redirect, which you have to whitelist any non-path like path URL. So that if you're trying to go off-site with the URL, it has to be whitelisted. Um, this came up a lot in Rails apps, Ilving Social. We had a lot of uh, apps that were open to open redirects. So uh, it's kind of an issue in all frameworks, really. So it's an area we'd like to see better addressed. So this is kind of a, a minor one, but it's, um, it's kind of a funny one because I don't think a lot of people would think about it that when you start up your dev environment, it's going to be listening on all interfaces. So, you know, you're sitting in that coffee shop and your brand new super secret startup application is open to the world to see. So if I run Nmap, I can find this on the network and I can start poking at it. You know, you're probably not super security hardened at that point. So maybe I can find something, get on your laptop, do something bad. I don't know. It's not the end of the world, but it's one of those things that I don't understand why they don't do a better job of just locking this down to local host instead of opening it up to the world. But uh, this is also an issue in Rails, so. Rails isn't looking that good in this talk, honestly. But. So, to kind of wrap it up, I mean, there's some other things that it doesn't do um, out of the box. Click jacking, doesn't have X-frames options uh, by default. Um, the documentation for for security, I mean, I'm glad they actually have a security page on their website, which is great. Um, but it only addresses a few of the OWASP top 10. Um, and there's actually some factual inaccuracies on there that need to be fixed. So the documentation is not great. Uh, you have to do more digging pretty much into Google Groups and just random forum posts to figure out how to do certain things with Play. So it'd be great to have something 
that was like, you know, an OWASP guide to play security. Um, so SQL I, you can still do raw SQL just like pretty much every, every framework. You know, you can shoot yourself in the foot if you really try hard enough. Um, I'd like to see, I mean, they do warn you that if you do raw SQL, you could potentially get SQL injection. Um, I'd still like to make it a little harder for developers to do raw SQL. So there's an ex, you know, explicit, I am doing something stupid, but I still want to do it kind of check. Um, so I think the Lyft framework actually does uh, some interesting stuff around there. So that's something I want to look into more. Um, so and then security documentation. There's one page that the Play framework uh, has. It needs a lot more. Um, it needs kind of do's and don'ts and examples. Um, and you know, I think something that would be very useful is having an OWASP cheat sheet for play. Just like there's the Rails and there's PHP and there's you know, the various cheat sheets. So that's an area we're probably going to look into uh, kind of tackling some of these issues. All you. Nice. Um, so, okay. Getty. All right, so we're going to talk about Getty's insecure defaults and some things that I found that beyond the insecure defaults that were just kind of interesting. So um, by default, when you create an application, uh, the session signing key is in the source code. Uh, it's vulnerable to session fixation. There's mass assignment. Um, CSERF, again, it's not the, you know, easy, you can implement it, but it's not the easiest thing to implement. It's not the hardest, but it should be there by default. Um, open redirects, like Mike mentioned, uh, same thing with the dev environment bound to the, you know, all interfaces. Uh, and then there's the other category, which I'll talk about, which is some just interesting things. So the, on the left-hand column, upper left-hand column is the documentation, and that sort of tells you, hey, this is the file that your secret key should go in within the source code. So that's where we start off not on the, you know, great foot. One thing it does right, though, is that this, uh, on the, Top right, um, that's in a git ignore file. Do you, you guys are pretty familiar with git, well you know what, if you're not, a git ignore file says when you check your source code, repository, uh, source code into a repository, ignore these files, folders, etc. So by default when you generate a Getty app it actually creates this um, git ignore file. So that's something that, that they're doing right and I, I like and I commend and at the same time, um, you know, I question seeing how many, if you Google this like, you know, how do I deal with session secrets in production on Getty? Most people say, eh, it's too difficult to get into production, so I just remove that line from Git ignore. And that kind of goes back to the whole environment variable um, that Mike was talking about uh, as a default, or a really strong warning where you have to proceed in order to boot it up that says, this is not a great idea. Something that uh, is uh, pretty strong. Uh, this is a secrets.json file at the bottom, and you know you see, see our secret key there. So we're going to talk a little bit about mass assignment. I don't know who's all familiar with mass assignment. I'll show you what it means. Essentially, the concept is uh, you have a model object. We'll say a user. The user has attributes that you see in a database associated with their, you know, with their profile. Um, those attributes could be you know, first name, last name, email address, etc. Um, they could be other things like admin or, you know, roles or whatever. Um, and then the issue is when you take input from the user, you instantiate that model object as code, you know, you do a .new or new something, depending on the language, uh, with those parameters and those additional parameters the user gave you now become bound to an actual database item. So if I were not to, you know, provide you a form that had admin equals true in it, and uh, you went, ha went ahead and added that in your request, um, my code, if not properly protected, would just say, look, uh, this guy says he's admin equals true, put that in the database and, you know, off you go. So um, I'm actually going to show you what that means, though, for anyone who's not super familiar with it. So first you see a SQLite database, no users in it yet, uh, we haven't signed up. We're going to first create an account. Uh, edit it for brevity, so it's just going to populate real quick. And what we're going to do is take burp, intercept that request en route to the application, um, add an attribute admin, an additional parameter to the request, uh, set it as true, and then forward it on. 
We're going to verify that that change actually occurred within the database. Um, just to verify we can log in and that actually, you know, worked, that account was set up. Uh, but now we're going to review the database. I promise. Um, so here's the user, uh, test at test.com. Uh, we're going to zoom in on the admin column within the SQLite database and you'll see the true value showed up. It's a little bit dangerous, right? Because this is how we're making decisions on who you are, what you should access, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Rails, as Mike mentioned, Django, as I mentioned, um, have some protections built in. Um, to bypass these protections, it's a little bit difficult, Django, you have to remove some fields. Rails 3, you have, you have to explicitly allow that attribute to be modified in that way within your models. And then in Rails 4, uh, they have essentially a, um, uh, a whitelist where you say these are the only parameters permitted into this uh, model object as I instantiate it. This framework has none of that. So what you see here is uh, the model code. You know what? I dug into this pretty deep. Um, and I couldn't find very easily, so none of the documentation within the code, I couldn't very easily find a way to actually protect these attributes. If somebody knows of a way, I'm all ears, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was not able to find any way to do that. And honestly, if I'm digging in and can't find it, then there's already a problem. So um, what you see with the required true and false, not a big deal. That's actually nothing to do with security. What that is is uh, if you want to instantiate an object and uh, you want to make sure that these parameters are always passed in as you update them or as you create a user that they're included, that's what the required true or false means. It doesn't have any security impl implications at all. The one thing you can do though with, um, with uh, Getty is there's an update properties function that you call to update a model object. So like if I want to update the user's first name, last name, whatever, um, there is an option to skip certain parameters. But at that point you're doing a blacklist versus a whitelist and we're all security people so we know that's probably not the, the, the best way to go about it. So uh, by default I would surmise that uh, Getty's vulnerable. Uh, in terms of session fixation, one thing I wanted to know is this behaves a little bit differently in um, production than it does in environment, uh, production than it does in develop, the development environment. Um, and something to note uh, is that although it behaves differently, I could very easily see some settings being tweaked and it behaving the exact same way. So either way, um, the session handling doesn't work well in production or in development. But it's a little bit better in production. So what you're going to see uh, is we're going to set our own cookie as we visit the website before we authenticate. We're going to authenticate to the application. Then we're going to verify our cookie has not changed. It is the value that we provided to the application. Then we're going to um, visit another resource just to make sure that a resource that requires you to be authenticated actually, um, it's just basically doing the same thing twice to make sure that this cookie is, you know, the cookie used for authentication and that we can set it ourselves. I'm going to ask after this video is over somebody to explain session fixation or somebody who knows it to give a brief explanation of why it's bad. So we're going to set our cookie pre-authentication to this is a test, that's the value. All right, so now we got to check the cookie again. Still, this is a test. And we're logged in. Uh, as you can see, it says you successfully logged in. But just to be sure, we're going to visit an authenticated resource called users, verify that we can access it, and that cookie that's used to access it is the one we set. There we go. So, you know, session fixation. Um, by the way, is this super awkward to stand back there? <laughs> Not at all, it's great. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Um, Anybody know session fixation or can it give like a pretty brief explanation on why it's bad? Ari, what's up, man? How you doing?
Yep, exactly. So what Ari basically to, to repeat that, uh, what Ari's saying is that um, if there's a flaw where you have XSS and the cookie doesn't have HTTP only set um, and you can actually set it, so let's say I use cross-site scripting to set your cookie. If I can set your cookie to a value I know, you log in and then you know, I know the cookie value. I can just go in right behind you and authenticate to the application you because I know that cookie value. I know it's valid. Um, thank you, by the way, Ari. Uh, okay, so oh. I'm going to zoom in on this. Let's see if we can get a better. All right, so C-Surf, this goes back to the whole almost anti-pattern that we see where it's um, instead of being enabled by default, um, you have to add this line into your application controller and it's the same way with Rails, how Rails has a, a base level class and the application controller, so does Getty, where every other controller inherits from it unless you skip something, unless you uh, decide not to. Um, so you have to enable it first in the controller uh, and then within a form field, you have to manually put in a in hidden input that says, you know, here's a same origin token that the, uh, this protect from forgery function call produces. So to me, that just seems like a lot of work. Why can't the framework do that for me? Why should I even have to think about it? Why, why not from default, like protect from forgery is on and the form auto generates these things? I, to me, it just it, it seems a lot harder than it should be, and it leads to a lot of mistakes. Because I don't know a lot of developers who are trying to kick out an app real quick. They're gonna, you know, hey, did I get C surf right? I just don't see it happening. So um, you want to get things built. So um, back to open redirection. I wanted to make a video real quick to actually show what open redirection means. So what Mike was trying to say is that these methods are usually called redirect, right? Redirect you to something, whether it be an input you gave me, something I hard coded, whatever, I'm going to redirect you somewhere. Um, but when the URL is outside of the path of the application, so instead of saying, like, let's say I have example.com as my website. If I want to go to, like, something.com because, you know, whatever, user gave me input or I want to redirect you somewhere, I should have to call unsafe redirect in, my, in our opinion. Um, it should be very explicit that, you know, this is something that could potentially be da dangerous versus redirect, which is, again, I like the word you use, benign, and it's just, you know, it's easy to, 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 cause, to shoot yourself in the foot. So the code uh, here, this just says this read.redirect uh, with the parameter URL that I've supplied to the application. Clearly we know that's probably not the best way to, to go about handling that. Um, it's a little bit of uh, code on your left, uh, not code, uh, an example explanation of how to use redirect. And here's the video. So first of all, just like Rails and um, most MVC frameworks, there's a, a router there, uh, a route file. So we've created a route called, uh, you know, forward slash test goes to the main controller and the test method. So when you call, you know, www.example.com forward slash test, you're going to go into this controller's method and some code's going to execute. What we're going to do is take the URL parameter from the user and just blindly redirect them to wherever we want to go. Again, this is, you know, nothing too crazy, I'm sure, but um, if that wasn't Google, you know, clearly we'd have some issues. If that was a bad guy's website, this in and of itself is not a huge deal. It's not, I mean, it doesn't seem like it anyways, but these are the patterns that we think need to be broken. It needs to be recognized that these things aren't super safe and make it easy for developers to be aware of that. So these are the other interesting things I found. So by default, Getty allows you to generate an authentication schema for Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, a regular login system like we saw with the database. It all gets auto-generated. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, except for, so you're going to have to do as a developer a little bit of modification to customize it to your own way of doing things, how you want to uh, handle users, updating their profiles, et cetera, et cetera. But if from the very start, senior developer is probably not an issue. A junior developer, if a junior developer sees this where it says params.id, we're going to find the user with that ID. We're going to take that parameter from the user and look up, you know, that user in the database. Um, if they reuse this code that's auto-generated by this uh, framework or keep it, 
uh, they're immediately vulnerable, right? Insecure direct object reference. They're not doing it by the session. They're doing, it based, they're doing a decision making on what you can update, how you can access it based off of parameter the user supplied. So by default, that's, you know, that's bad. So um, the username, uh, where it says this username is already in use, again, by default, you're giving an example of username enumeration within your auto-generated code. So like I said, while I really like this framework, I really do, I, I think it's pretty cool, it's a good initiative uh, being undertaken. Um, you know, there's some things that need to be hardened and there's no reason why, why you know, we can't collectively involve ourselves in it. Uh, and this is the, this is really strange. So what you would think is maybe happening here is I'm firing up this uh, server in a development environment, but I actually provided it the production environment variable and in production, I don't know why really, and I'm not, you know, I really don't know why, um, your secret keys are immediately printed out to the console. So I don't know what the reason, can, I mean, does anybody, can anybody think of a legitimate reason to do that? Okay. Um, and on port 4000, it's bound to all interfaces so anybody, you know, on the same wireless network or network um, could access that application. I love this picture. <laughs> All right, so essentially we want to break the cycle where MVC frameworks, where web development frameworks in general have by default insecure ways of showing code examples, lacks, lack of documentations, methods that seem fine and aren't because they're poorly named or, you know, there just wasn't a consideration when those methods were named. Um, sometimes, you, like the mass assignment with Getty, you know, kind of question if we're learning from other frameworks and we're piggybacking off things they've already had to deal with and the turmoil they've already gone through. So we want to break this, the, the cycle. So what we propose is um, essentially to create a pattern cheat sheet of how to build an MVC or what things to uh, put into an MVC, how to name functions, how to um, secure these insecure defaults. Um, how to do sessions the right way. <laughs> How to do sessions the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Pretty much everything you need in an MVC, all the things we've seen be insecure in other MVCs, do it the right way from the beginning so that these MVCs aren't built. Then someone says, oh, this is insecure, go back and fix it, but everything's already built that way. So basically, yeah, a cheat sheet for how to build your web application framework. So it's a, a little bit hard for us to collectively solve the issue by saying, hey, everybody devote some time to, um, you know, pull, putting in pull requests and monitoring new frameworks that are out. But what it, I think we can do is create an OWASP project, project to actually um, put together sort of a step-by-step -step for if you're going to build a web development framework, these are the things you should probably think about. These are the things that have been learned over time. Let's help, uh, you know, solve the issue. So um, that's our proposed solution after think, because we kind of went into this and I, th I think we were under the impression, well, we're going to review these frameworks and we're going to see like, wow, they did all these great things and, you know, the new ones are, and actually in the real reality, some of the newer frameworks had protections that the older frameworks didn't and it just doesn't seem like there's a learning process going on. So we want to thank OWASP, uh, AppSec Cali, uh, Red Bull, GoGo InFlights, the inventor of MyFi's. These are the things that have kept us alive over the last few weeks. Um, all of you guys for coming out. <laughs> all of you guys for coming out.